Inanna was a Mesopotamian goddess of great antiquity, being first mentioned in text in the 4th century BC. We know of her from clay tablets bearing cuneiform inscriptions. The earliest record of her dates from around 3500 BC as the principal Sumerian goddess and patron of the city of Uruk. Most of what we know of her is later than this on cuneiform tablets dating from Sargon of Akkad and after, by which time she had been syncretised with Ishtar. Sargon of Akkad lived from 2334 to 2279 BC. His daughter was the Akkadian high priestess and poet Enheduanna, who lived from 2285 to 2250 BC. She tells us that Inanna was identified with Ishtar and rose from a local crop cycle god of the Sumerians to become Queen of Heaven and Mesopotamia's principal goddess. She was the god of fertility, sensual love and war. Then she was syncretised with the Hittite goddess Sauska, the Phoenician Astarte or Ashtarath, who is mentioned in the Old Testament, the Greek Aphrodite and then finally the Roman Venus. She may have been associated with the fertility goddess Demeter and with the Greek thonic goddess Persephone, queen of the underworld. There are some parallels between Inanna and the Egyptian god Osiris. Both were very ancient, both were popular and widely worshipped and both were still being worshipped at the time of Jesus. Like Osiris, Inanna was not one of hundreds of obscure gods, but a widespread and prominent god in the Roman Empire. Without the natural desert defences of Egypt, Mesopotamian civilizations were more prone to external conquest than was the Egyptian civilization, and conquering people tended to syncretize their own religions with those of the areas that they invaded. For this reason, Inanna had more syncretization over a longer period of time than did Osiris. Inanna was a strong, independent woman who did pretty much what she wanted, whatever the consequences. She threatened, manipulated, cajoled or seduced others to fix the problems that she had created. She was associated with extramarital affairs, but not with motherhood or marriage. She appears in several myths, such as Inanna and the Halupu tree, which is an early creation myth, and Inanna and the God of Wisdom, where she receives wisdom and knowledge from Enki, the God of Wisdom, while he was drunk, and then gives the knowledge and culture to the city of Uruk. In the courtship of Inanna and Dimuzi, she marries the God of Plant Growth. And in the descent of Inanna, which is dated from 1900 to 1600 BC, she visits the underworld. This last one is of particular relevance to the question of the historicity of Jesus, because mythicists maintain that it contains potential parallels with the crucifixion and resurrection. Inanna appears in the 2100 BC Akkadian poem The Epic of Gilgamesh as Ishtar, promiscuous, spiteful and jealous. She attempted to seduce Gilgamesh, but he rejected her because of the ill fate that she had meted out to her previous lovers. Angered by his rejection, she sent Gugulana, the Bull of Heaven, to destroy Gilgamesh and his dominion, but Gilgamesh's comrade Enkidu killed Gugulana. This angered the gods who killed Enkidu, whose death prompted Gilgamesh's quest to find the meaning of life. So it's the myth about Inanna's descent into the underworld that is the one with claimed parallels to Jesus. As always, there are several versions, but this is the best known. The Akkadian underworld, or Kerr, was a dark, cold cave deep underground ruled by Inanna's sister Ereshkigal, where life was a shadowy version of life on Earth. Inanna visited Kerr to attend a funeral, whose varies with the version of the myth. The Underworld Code required that anyone entered could not leave unless they were appointed messengers, so before going she instructed her servant, Ninshibu, to entreat several gods to come and rescue her if she did not return within three days. Inanna got doled up for the trip with a turban, wig, lapis lazuli necklace, beads, dress, mascara, breastplate, gold ring and carried a lapis lazuli staff. Each item represented one of her powers. Ereshkigal was suspicious of Inanna's non-mournful attire and proud manner, so on Ereshkigal's instructions, the underworld gatekeeper made Inanna hand over her lapis lazuli staff at the first of seven gates, and at each succeeding gate she had to hand over another piece of apparel, and thus power, so that she was naked and powerless when she got to her sister. Then this happened. Naked and bowed low, Inanna entered the throne room. Ereshkigal rose from her throne. Inanna started towards the throne. 
The Anuna, the judges of the underworld, surrounded her. They passed judgment against her. Then Ereshkigal fastened on Inanna the eye of death. She spoke against her the word of wrath. She uttered against her the cry of guilt. She struck her. Inanna was turned into a corpse, a piece of rotting meat, and was hung from a hook on the wall. When, after three days and three nights, Inanna had not returned, Ninshubur set up a lament for her by the ruins. Then what happened is Ninshubur asked three gods to rescue Inanna. They refused, and a fourth agreed and created two figures to go to Ereshkigal and ask for the corpse. When they got there, they found her in agony, like a woman giving birth, and she offered them whatever they wanted to relieve the suffering. They only took the corpse hanging on the hook on the wall, which they sprinkled with the food and water of life, and Inanna revived. Ereshkigal sent demons who insisted that she could not leave the underworld unless someone took her place. Inanna agreed to send someone back in her place, and the demons went with her to make sure she did. She went back through the seven gates, picking up her bits of apparel as she did. On their way out of the underworld, they came across several candidates for this replacement, which the demons requested, but Inanna refused on the grounds that they were suitably mourning her death. Then they found Inanna's husband, Dumuzid, who was lavishly dressed and reclining in a grand throne under a tree, enjoying the attentions of a bevy of slave girls, with no trace of mourning. Inanna took umbrage and sent Dumuzid off to the underworld with the demons. In other versions of the story, various shenanigans resulted in Demuzid spending every other six months in the underworld, during which time Inanna's powers of fertility declined to recover on his return, leading to the seasons of the year. So Inanna was a dying and rising god, and her death was associated with three days and three nights, but it's pretty clear that she was not crucified. She was not put to death by being attached to a cross and left hanging there until she died. Rather, she was killed by a blow or a curse, and her corpse, a piece of rotting meat, was hung from a hook on the wall. Some mythicists maintain that she was crucified based on this similarity. Her death could be categorised with Jesus, as the end result in both cases was a corpse being suspended above the ground from a structure, but I've just invented that category for the purpose. It's not a valuable category for any other purpose. It's true that this category contains Ishtar and Jesus and no other gods I can think of, but that's hardly impressive. For example, gods associated by church fathers with a Eucharist-type meal and baptism is a group that contains Jesus and Mithras, and no others as far as I know. There are other similarities, though. Regarding the three days and three nights, Nishuba is alerted to trouble when Inanna fails to return after three days and three nights. This has parallels with Matthew 12. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the signs of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Of course, we learn from the Passion narratives that Jesus died on Friday evening and was put in the tomb, which was found empty at dawn on Sunday morning, making two nights and one day in the tomb. Apologists have wrestled with this contradiction and concluded that the ancients counted days inclusively, so that if Jesus was in the tomb for any part of any day-night pair, they both counted. So he went into the tomb on Friday, that's one day and night. He was there on Saturday, that's another day and night and left early in the morning on Sunday, that's a third day and night. A bit contrived, maybe. But it is true that the same three days and three nights does occur in both Matthew and the descent of Inanna over 2,000 years earlier. That's it for parallels between Inanna and standard Christianity, but there are additional parallels with two non-canonical texts. One of these is an obscure Christian text of unknown authorship called The Ascension of Isaiah. This dates from somewhere between the late 1st and early 3rd centuries AD. It's a compilation of several Christian texts. One of these describes a vision in which Isaiah was taken by an angel through seven heavens, the seventh heaven being the highest in greatness where he sees God and Jesus. He then witnesses Jesus descending through the seven heavens. At each stage, Jesus alters his form so that he looks the same as those of the heavens he is passing through, and in this way he is not recognised nor worshipped by lower angels. So this Ascension of Isaiah story adds another couple of parallels with the myth of Inanna, as she descended through seven gateways and made some change of attire on passing through each, in her case divesting herself of some item of apparel. 
compared to Jesus who changed his form to fit the inhabitants of the heaven he was going through. The second book of Enoch is the other non-canonical Christian text, which also describes a hierarchy of heavens, only in this case there are ten. However, Enoch can see God from the seventh heaven, but only from a distance. If Inanna or Ishtar was one of hundreds of gods who shared the same circumstantial evidence, I would dismiss these out of hand as being pure coincidence. But she was not one of hundreds of gods to share the same circumstantial evidence. She was a prominent god of the ancient world and was worshipped at the time of Jesus. And I would estimate that she was one of not more than about ten such gods. This has the effect of reducing the closeness of parallels necessary before we accept them as causal. Turning to the circumstantial evidence connecting Inanna to the origins of Christianity, this is fair. Inanna or Ishtar was an important and popular god in Mesopotamia who was worshipped well into the Roman period and was being worshipped at the time of Jesus. Furthermore, there was a Hellenic and possibly Canaanite syncretism in the form of Ashtoreth, who is mentioned in the Old Testament and was worshipped in the Levant. We do have a great deal of ancient text about Inanna more than most other gods, thanks to the durability of cuneiform clay tablets of Mesopotamia, and this wealth of information provides an increased number of opportunities for parallels by chance, or parallels that are simply products of the psychology of God-making, and have no direct causal link to Jesus. There is one other piece of possible circumstantial evidence, and that is that the story of Inanna's courtship with her husband Demuzid may have a common root to the Hebrew story of Cain and Abel. Inanna is courted by a farmer and a shepherd. At first, Inanna prefers the farmer, but is persuaded to go for the shepherd Dumuzid. Both myths involve a farmer and a shepherd competing for the favours of a god, and the god ultimately chooses the shepherd. So how is the Inanna precedence for Jesus countered? Well, the parallels between Jesus and Inanna are problematic. The crucifixion one is particularly important because the crucifixion is the single most historicising event in the whole Jesus narrative. It is the one that is most widely cited both within the Bible and in extra-canonical historical sources and fits the historical narrative of an apocalyptic preacher crucified for sedition particularly well. As such, if the crucifixion story could be shown to have originated from syncretism with another god, it would seriously undermine the case for historicity but this has not been shown, and the case has been overstated in some cases to the point of dishonesty. The three-day and three-night parallel is fair, as it refers to a single reference in Matthew, and only controversially to the time Jesus spent in the tomb. The other parallels are with non-canonical texts, which are later than the canonical ones, and could have occurred either by chance or by syncretism that postdated the original Jesus story. So, as with Osiris and Mithras, it is reasonable to assert that there was syncretism between Christianity and Inanna or Ishtar, but I reject the idea that the crucifixion itself was such a syncretism. The more credible syncretism applies to the three days in the tomb, the resurrection, and other peripheral ancient Christian theology. In other words, it applies to the aspects of the Jesus story which both mythicists and historicists agree are mythical. Finally, though, Inanna does provide a counter to the crucified Messiah argument put in my video of that name. This is the argument that a mythical Jesus would not have been crucified because the purposes of evangelising and gaining converts would not be well served by such a humiliating and ignominious event in the life of a person who is supposed to be worshipped. Maybe so, but in Inanna we have another example of a god who had an ignominious and humiliating death and who was mythical. She may not have been crucified, but being hung on a hook on the wall and having her body described as a piece of rotting meat is not the kind of storyline you'd expect adoring fans to make up. And yet somebody did. So overall there are some weak pointers from the Inanna story towards mythicism. In my video on Osiris, I looked at the possibility that the Osiris story could have been used by early historicist Christians to interpret and embellish a historical Jesus figure, or by early mythicist Christians to provide a mythical Jesus figure who was later euhemerized. Both ideas are less attractive in the case of Inanna or Ishtar. Where Osiris was associated with devotion, judgment of sin and the afterlife, Inanna was promiscuous, capricious, vengeful and self-serving, 
quite unlike Jesus. So I can't see how her story could be used to support historicity, and therefore, on balance, I consider that it does support mythicism, but only marginally. <laughs>